good morning everybody uh, it's a great pleasure to be your chair today my name is christine foyer um, and um, it's wonderful to be able to introduce our speaker who is beatrice fernandez Maran. Uh, beatrice has uh, yeah. a long record of working on the photo protection uh, mechanisms in desiccation tolerant plants uh, I'm particularly looking at the way that um, the xanthus fail cycle and defense components enable oh, organisms to um, survive uh, in extreme environments. Sorry, I hope you can see me now. Um, so, um, B is, an, uh, as I say, uh, an assistant professor. Uh, in the Department of uh, Botany, Ecology and Plant Physiology in the University of Lagina in Tenerife in Spain. Um, she has worked uh, not only in Spain, but also in the UK and, and in Austria, um, where she, she um, had a Marie Curie Fellowship. Um, all her work has contributed to our understanding of how plants are able to survive extreme environments. So without further ado, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to ask me to start on her uh, presentation on the topic of frozen in the dark, night activity of xanthophyll uh, cycle zymon attributes and desiccation tolerance interplay uh, in uh, fern uh, resistance to winter. B, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. And I will try to share my screen now. Just let me know if, if you can see it properly already. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to, to thank also the invitation because for me it's a pleasure to, to be able to share my research with all of you. And I also thank uh, to the audience because of being here this morning. My idea for um, summarizing uh, this uh, manuscript, this research, is to divide the talk in two sections. So I would like to start with an introduction where I would like to define uh, properly for what I think are key uh, concepts to this research. And then in the second part of the talk, I will present a summary of the results and I will make a bit uh, of a discussion of these results, but I will also present a small context. So why we did each of the experiments. So the group of firms evolved more than 350 million years ago. And currently we have more than 10,000 species growing in many different ecosystems around the globe. From a physiological perspective, uh, the group of ferns have been much more understudied than seed plants. And maybe because ferns evolved in a relatively warm period, and maybe also because now the highest diversity we can find in tropical environments, one of the most neglected aspects from a physiological perspective in ferns is their performance under low temperature and under freezing conditions. And this even when many of the species are evergreen. So what happened to a plant, to a photosynthetic tissue when it goes under freezing conditions? When the ice is formed inside the leaf, this will enter into a risk, a high risk of photooxidation. This happened because the chlorophyll will be still absorbing light energy, even when this cannot be any further used for carbon fixation. Also, the tissue will suffer mechanical stress because of the extracellular ice formation and the freeze-induced dehydration of the cells. Additionally, during subsequent freezing and thawing events, the xylem suffer a high risk of embolism. And this happened because the gas, which is dissolved in the liquid within the xylem, comes out of solution during the freezing process, and then the bubbles can expand during the thawing of the xylem and block the xylem. 
So interestingly, many of these risks that we have revised now are also faced by resurrection plants, by desiccation tolerant plants. This is a particular strategy followed by some vascular species. So they are able to, to dehydrate completely to equilibrate the relative humidity of the earth and then to resume normal metabolic activity once they have been rehydrated. This is a completely different strategy to others that we can also find in, in similar environments where low water availability is intermittent. So some species will not be there during this uh, limiting session and then will stand as a reproductive structure or, or as a, a subterranean organ during the uh, dry period. Other species, we will find them there, but we, we cannot find their leaves during this very dry period. A third strategy is to avoid the dehydration within the tissues. So these plants are drought tolerant, but they try to either accumulate water into their tissues or to develop a very extensive root system that can guarantee the hydrated state, even, the, even when the water is a really limiting factor in the environment. Finally, we have the true tolerant strategy of the species. So a couple of species are able to actually dehydrate to lose uh, virtually all the water within their cells, but then are able to recover after rewatering. And if you see on the bottom of the slide, we can find a similar parallelism when talking about plants that can really withstand freezing temperatures. The research today will be focused on a species that are truly tolerant, so that are able to tolerate total dehydration of their cells or that are able to tolerate ice formation within their tissues. Desiccation tolerance is a more or less common strategy within reproductive structures such as spores or seeds, but has a much more restricted distribution if we are talking about synthetic tissues. In the case of vascular plants, the group of ferns contains a higher proportion of species already being described as desiccation tolerance. So, um, as we were discussing before, there are several stresses that will be faced by freezing tolerant species that will be also faced by, by desiccation tolerant species. The cells will suffer mechanical stress during this massive loss of water that can also lead to the loss of cell compartmentalization. Because of this severe dehydration, the risk of irreparable embolism is also high. And here pay attention at the very low water potentials that the tissues can reach these are even lower than min minus 100 megapascals. Because most of these species uh, keep the chlorophyll content and the chloroplast ultrastructure more or less uh, in an intact way, the risk of photoxidation is also very high. So in essence, freezing tolerant species and desiccation tolerant species share many of their physiological mechanisms of tolerance. One of these shared mechanisms is the downregulation of the maximal photochemical efficiency of FVFN. This downregulation, which is called sustained energy dissipation or winter photoinhibition, when talking about low temperatures, has been extensively studied in evergreens, particularly in conifers. And two main components can be distinguished according to the speed of reversibility upon rewarming. So we, we have a dynamic component whenever this down regulation is reverted upon a few minutes or hours under warm conditions. 
And we also have a chronic component, which is reversible after several days under warm conditions, and typically at the end of the cold season, so at the beginning of the spring and of winter. This control and reversible down regulation of the maximal photochemical efficiency can be also found during desiccation and rehydration cycles in resurrection plants. The down regulation is typically accompanied by accumulation of zeaxanthin, a carotenoid which is accumulated in the chloroplast, and this uh, carotenoid uh, is part of the so-called xanthophyll cycle. The classical view of the xanthophyll cycle assumed that only under excess light conditions the bioaxanthin, another carotenoid, which is also located in the thylakoid, was converted to anthraxanthin and finally to zeaxanthin. And then under low light or darkness, the process was reverted. However, in the last decade, we have compiled a lot of evidences from lab experiments that now support that the deepoxidation of bioaxanthin uh, to zeaxanthin can happen in complete darkness. And this is when induced by specific stressors, such as desiccation or anoxia or high temperature. Because this zeaxanthin formation is happening in darkness, this aspect highlights the relevance of this molecule, not only in thermal energy dissipation, in photoprotection directly, but also in the protection of the thylakoid membrane integrity through its antioxidant and stabilization properties. So even when we have already revised now that many of the physical and physiological consequences of severe desiccation and of ice formation within the tissues are shared between freezing tolerant and desiccation tolerant species, so far, only two resurrection angiosperms that are additionally able to tolerate freezing have been described. These are Ramonda miconi, that you can see in the picture, which is uh, endemic to the Pyrenees, and Aberlea rhodopensis, another species from the same family, which grows in the Balkan uh, mountains. So with all this information in mind, we decided to deepen into some of the physiological mechanisms that may uh, enable winter wind ferns to tolerate, to tolerate uh, freezing. In particular, we focused on some silent conduit traits and in their relationship with ice formation and propagation within the fronts. And secondly, we also focus on photoprotective, photoprotective mechanisms and their potential induction by freezing temperatures. We hypothesize that maybe the mechanisms of tolerance in resurrection plants, in resurrection ferns in this case, may uh, represent some advantages to face freezing conditions also. So for this purpose, we selected five wintergreen species which are commonly found in temperate areas in Europe. And three of them uh, have already been described as desiccation tolerance in the literature. These are Asplenin trichomanes, Thetaratophysinarum, and Polypod in Bulgaria. And we studied also two desiccation sensitive species, Asplenium scolopendrium and Adianthus capillus venetis. The three tolerant species will be so far, will be thereafter represented in red, orange, or yellow colors. And the desiccation sensitive species will be always represented in blue color. So we performed three main sets of experiments with the intention of uh, characterizing the tolerances to both desiccation and freezing in the fronts of these species. Then with the objective of evaluating silent traits, uh, basically some anatomical traits, and the relationship with freezing tolerance. And finally, uh, we wanted to study sub-zero temperatures and the potential uh, effect on the activation of photoprotection mechanisms. 
So the first question we wanted, we wanted to answer was whether or not the, the, the fronts of these desiccation tolerant species were still tolerant to desiccation during winter time. And this question was pertinent because some resurrection ferns produce two different cohorts of fronts. And only those produced during the dry season are actually tolerant to desiccation, while the others produced during the wet season are sensitive to desiccation. So always working, working with uh, winter fronts, we perform a control experiment where we desiccated following a protocol similar to that described by Lopez Pozo in 2018. We desiccated uh, pieces of the fronts at 50% relative humidity for several hours. And then 24 hours after the rehydration, we measured FDFM as an estimation of the viability. In our results, we found that all the five species were severely desiccated during the treatment. So all of them uh, showed a relative water content below 40% at the end of the desiccation. And then upon re rehydration, the FDFM reach values over 80% uh, compared to the controls only in the desiccation tolerant species. So in principle, we can conclude that yes, that the winter fronts of these three tolerant species are able to desiccate and recover afterwards in winter time too. The second question was uh, whether or not the fronts of these five species were able to tolerate freezing. In this case, we conducted a controlled freezing experiment in the lab. So we subjected the fronts to a control a cooling rate of three Kelvin per hour. This is the highest speed that has already been recorded in the field by Noina and uh, co-workers in 2013. And that can actually ha happen in nature. Once uh, the samples were at the target temperature of minus seven degrees, the samples were kept there for 16 hours. And the whole freezing was conducted in Darmex. So we were simulating a wintertime night. After this, the samples were rewarmed. And we measured FVFM at the beginning and at the end of the freezing, and at three different time points during rehydration. The results are shown here. And we found first that all the species suffer a significant decrease in the FVFM at the end of this uh, freezing event. Then during the rewarming, only the three desiccation tolerant species were able to recover control FVFM values. So apparently only these three desiccation tolerant species are additionally tolerant to freezing. The second set of experiments, we will be focused on the silent traits and on the relationship with the freezing tolerance. Key anatomical traits of the silent, such as the conduit dimensions, the diameter or the pit uh, properties, are a determinant of many processes related to freezing tolerance. Those processes are mainly the risk of suffering irreparable, freeze-induced embolism, the temperature of, at which ice will be formed within the fronts, and also the pattern uh, of ice during the propagation through the front. From the literature, uh, we can see that wider conduits, wider uh, diameters are usually related with a higher risk of suffering irreparable embolism. So we decided to measure the, con the conduit dimensions, basically the diameter and the cross-section area of each single conduit in our five species. So we cut this type at approximately one centimeter from the front blade, look under the microscope and analyze the images through the ImageJ software. We obtained 
the hydraulic diameter of the trachates. And we found that on average, the sensitive species showed higher diameters, around 28 micrometers, than the tolerant species that show values around 15 micrometers. Also, the tracheid growth session uh, cumulative area was significantly higher for these two sensitive species. But more importantly, the contribution to the total conductive area was more relevant for small tracheids in the desiccation tolerant species. By contrast, the desiccation sensitive species had on wider tracheids the major contribution to the total conductive area. So in essence, it seems that hydraulic conductivity relies more on narrow conduits in the desiccation tolerant species. The values we found uh, fall within the range uh, for other species uh, in temperate environments, other species of firms, and also for the values found for polystichum acrosticoides, a freezing tolerant fern growing in the north of America, for which uh, it has been already evidenced that sub zero temperatures are able to significantly, but no lethally, induce some loss in conductivity. So as a summary, we can guess now that narrow conduits may prevent irreparable freeze-induced embolism in our restoration fern species. Another factor related to the dimensions of the conduits is the ice nucleation temperature. As we know from measurements on trees, it seems that narrow conduits are related to lower temperatures of ice nucleation within the xylem. In this case, to estimate the ice nucleation temperature, we followed two different approaches. First, we use a differential scanning calorimeter to estimate the ice nucleation temperature. In this equipment, we basically have two pans. In one of them, we have our sample, and in the other, we have air as a reference. During a controlled cooling rate of, again, 3 Kelvin per hour, the equipment will try to keep uh, both pans at the same temperature. When the ice freezing, uh, when the water freezing occurs, the energy needed for the sample pan will be smaller than the one needed for the reference. And this is because of the heat released during the uh, freezing of water. This is what we can see here already in the graph as an exotherm peak. With this technique, we can uh, obtain ice nucleation temperature and additionally, we can uh, obtain also the enthalpy related to this freezing process. Because we know the mass of the sample and the amount of water within the sample, we can finally estimate another interesting parameter, which is the freezeable uh, water, the percentage of freezeable water within the tissue. So, we obtain both parameters, principal water content and the ice nucleation temperature. And we found significant differences between among the species, but we couldn't find a clear pattern to distinguish desiccation tolerant from desiccation uh, sensitive species. The second approach uh, was to move to the field and to directly attach thermocouples to the fronts by recording the temperature of the fronts at a high speed and also recording temperature of uh, the surrounding environment as a reference, we were also able to obtain these exotherms and we were able to detect exactly at which temperature, at which front temperature ice was happening in the field. With this approach, we obtained that all the species were freezing at a similar temperature of approximately minus three degrees centigrade. So overall, and irrespective of whether we use the ice nucleation temperature obtained by DSC or by the thermocouples, with these results, we cannot support a relationship 
between the ice nucleation temperature and the dimension of the tracheids. The third, the third process related with the silent dimensions is the pattern of ice propagation. We also assess the, this pattern in our samples. Essentially, we use a thermal infrared camera and conducted an infrared differential thermal analysis. With this analysis, what we do is basically subtract the image, which is just before the ice nucleation within our samples, and then we subtract this image from the all following images of the sequence. In that way, uh, we will see the ice formation as a heat release, so it will be represented as white pixels, are, uh, and would be surrounded by a darker um, background. So we can actually visualize the spatial pattern of ice within the fronts. After the analysis, we were unable to, to clearly find a pattern that distinguishes all tolerant species from all desiccation sensitive species. But it's true that the two sensitive species showed a very smooth and very wide propagation of the ice through all the silent conduits, while in two of the desiccation tolerant species, in Ceterats officinarum and in Polypodium vulgare, we found a fragmented pattern. Uh, this continuous pattern, you can see here, for instance, that one of the pinna is not frozen yet and will be frozen only at the end of the experiment. We still don't know whether this fragmented pattern is related uh, with particular properties of the silent, maybe the pits, or whether or not this uh, pattern has an important role in the tolerance to freezing of these species. But maybe could be related to the curling that we observe only for these two species of the fronts during freezing, and that resembles the same curling that we found when these species are desiccated. The last set of experiments will be focused on how photoprotective mechanisms are activated directly by freezing temperatures. In the first experiment of this set, we wanted to check how the photosynthetic pigment composition may be uh, altered by freezing temperatures. And to avoid any other stress factor, we perform the experiment in darkness. The most uh, remarkable result in this experiment was that freezing in darkness was able to induce a deepoxidation of the xanthophyll cycle pigments, in particular, a rise in the six xanthine content. We decided then to move to the field and to evaluate, to evaluate the winter photoinhibition in our five, uh, in three of our five fern species, in those that were actually tolerant. As already claimed in this revision by Miguel uh, et al. in 2015, winter photoinhibition has been well studied in many other uh, groups, but there are very few data concerning ferns. So what we did is to measure FVFM at natural pre dam and during different nights from November to March during winter time. First, we found that only one of the species, Asplenium trichomanes, seems to have a certain percentage of this chronic photoinhibition, because even when temperatures were uh, pretty high, uh, even higher than plus 80 degrees, the FVFM values that we recorded were always below the control values, which are around 0 0.8. The second result we got is that Whenever temperature falls below plus two degrees, and here temperature is represented as the average of the 24 hours previous to our measurement, whenever this temperature falls below plus two degrees, we were able to already find significant decrease in the FVFM values. And this decrease was happening 
in darkness. So we could expect that an increase in six something was also happening during these freezing nights. But to test that, we developed our last experiment. We monitored a VFM and we also took samples for pigment analysis at two main points. The first time point was at the end of the evening, so at the beginning of a frosty night. And the second time point was at the end of this same night. For one of the species, for a splenic trichomanes, we additionally rewarmed the samples in the lab and measure again. This is the time three. For both species, we found again a depression in the VFM value induced by freezing night. And what is more importantly, we found a significant increase in the sixantin, a significant activation of the deepoxidation of the carotenoids within the xanthophyll cycle. And this was induced by freezing in complete darkness. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first evidence directly taken in the field that can um, evidence the formation of sixantin induced by freezing in complete darkness. So as a summary of this work, our results suggest that probably a combination of both hydraulic and photochemical attributes may enable these resurrection firms to be also successful under freezing temperatures. More specifically, it is likely that narrow conduits are better preventing irreparable freeze flow induced embolism. And it's also very likely that photochemical protection mechanisms induced directly by freezing, uh, even in the absence of light, have an important role in the protection of these firms against freezing conditions. So finally, I would like to thank also all my co-authors for their help and their support and their capability to withstand freezing temperatures during the measurements too. And I would like to thank, thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, B. Um, that was an excellent talk and um, very, very interesting work. Um, I wonder if people would have any questions. I can't see any questions in the chat at the moment, um, but, but maybe um, uh, I can ask you a couple of questions because I find it fascinating. Um, do you know anything about the activation of the viloxanthin D epoxidase upon freezing? Have you, have you looked at the activity of the enzyme at all? No, like, do you mean really biochemical experiments and um, looking at the, at the um, it's, it, it's just that I know this is a very peculiar enzyme. It's activated by oxidation. It sits in the, the thylakoid lumen, as you showed very nicely in your picture. And it, and it requires uh, oxidation for ac activation. And I just, uh, I wondered if, if the freezing itself activated the enzyme. Um, you know, um, because of the oxidation caused by freezing. Uh, but I guess it might be quite hard for you to measure that, uh, you know. Yeah, currently we, we don't know exactly the mechanism uh, by which this, the enzyme can be actually activated in darkness. So our hypothesis was that it's probably related to the uh, biochemical and physical consequences of dehydration associated to freezing. So the, the lumen can suffer some, some changes and maybe for instance, this also this low pH, which is additionally needed for the activation of the enzyme. So maybe altered under these conditions, but the exact uh, uh, molecular mechanism, uh, we still don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm also, fascinated by the, um, do, do you think these processes are very separate, the xylem embolism and, and ice formation and the chloroplast function, or do you think they could be linked in some way by signaling or, or something like that? 
Yeah, in principle, they could be. Uh, or for me, it could be easy to think that they are uh, related under light conditions, because then we have the photosynthetic apparatus blocked, and then maybe some stomatal regulation or whatever, and then we have a connection with the xylem too. But uh, when in darkness, uh, actually, uh, we also don't know how, if, if they are related, in which way they will be. Yeah, um, I still can't see any questions, but but perhaps if anybody has a question, raise their hand or pop pop the question in the chat, and I will try try and look for it. Um, because I I can ask several questions myself. I mean, I'm I I'm quite interested in trees, and and what happens, for example, in pine trees? Is there something very similar? Do you think? Um, you know, with freezing there. Yeah, um, we we would need to test that uh, for the bibliography. What seems to be now in the literature is that what is blocked is the re-epoxidation. So the de-epoxidation can actually take place under light conditions, which is expectable because the photoxidative pressure must be quite high when you have these frozen uh, needles. But then what is blocked is the re-epoxidation back during the dark period. What we found here, uh, and we have been mostly studying these freezing events with uh, ferns and with hairs only, is that this uh, winter photoinhibition is much more dynamic than in conifers. And the other difference is that the deepoxidation can actually happen in darkness. So it's not needed uh, the light. Thank you. Um, we, we have a question from Richard uh, Bass. Uh, Richard, do you want to ask your own question or shall I ask it? Please unmute if you'd like to ask it yourself. Uh, yeah, I can ask it. <laughs> um, I was just curious if you had an idea of like how well this sustained um, QE state remains during like a transition from darkness to, to daylight um, and if day temperature has any effect on that like if the plants can photosynthesize normally in a cold day following a cold night or if it if the daylight if it has to warm up because it seems to me like in a in a bright environment in the cold that's probably the most photo damaging that it can be but I guess that's why they're they're priming with this overnight xanthophyll cycle so you mean the, the interaction between light and low temperatures and, and what is the influence on the photosynthetic performance afterwards? Yeah, I'm just curious, like how well these recover after after getting into this sustained quenching state? How do they, can they can they photosynthesize normally later in the day once it warms up or can it can they do that if it stays cold or? Yeah, you know? we, what we didn't do is to to perform gas exchange measurements. But uh, we have been recording uh, VFM measurements in very different uh, conditions and very different uh, days of freezing or not freezing temperatures and higher irradiance or lower irradiance. So my impression now is that the, um, the entering into this uh, photo inhibition state is a consequence of a mixture of very severe temperatures also of the accumulation of this freezing dose. So we got always lower values when several uh, days consecutively we have had very low temperatures. And additionally, uh, um, is related to the light conditions also. So if some of the days were uh, uh, with higher irradiance, we also found that the VFM at the pre down the, the days after this, uh, the VFM was lower. So apparently, yeah, it's a, it's a mixture of a, a stressful condition and the combination of light and of uh, cumulative low temperatures may have uh, an important role. Okay, thank you. Th thanks, B. Uh, there's another question from Matthias. Matthias, would you like to ask your question? Yes, if I, uh... Uh, thanks for this nice talk. So we wanted to know um, why there is a difference between the field freezing temperatures and the, and the freezing temperatures measured by the DSC 
Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, I showed you that we use two different approaches to estimate the ice nucleation temperature in the front. And uh, the reason why we get lower temperatures during the differential scanning calorimetry can be uh, that the size of the sample that we use, even when we control the cooling rate, which is important also in the ice nucleation temperature, the size of the sample is really small. We can use only something like 15 milligrams of the front within this band. So from a physical uh, perspective, the, the smaller the sample will be, you can get more, more chances of uh, introducing a bit artificially a super cooling effect in the sample. So because all my all our temperatures recorded through these techniques were uh, significantly lower than the temperatures recorded in the field, this quote could be one explanation. The other one is that freezing is actually quite heterogeneous and, and let's say complicated in nature. Uh, in natural conditions. So whenever we try to, to do an experiment, we are always subjecting the sample to a cooler environment that, than the sample itself. But in nature, uh, this can be the contrary. So the, the leaf samples are many times even cooler than the air. So, so the type of cooling is also physically different. Also from observations in the field, the pattern of ice formation within a single front can be different. So it's quite easy to find sometimes a section of a front which is already frozen and another section which is not. And this is just because of the small microenvironment. So parts are a bit more protected than others. So a mixture of all of that uh, could really explain these differences. Yeah, thanks. But it's nice answer. answer. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. Um, I can't see any more questions and we are almost out of time. Does anybody want to jump in with the last question before we say goodbye to B? No, I can't see anything. So um, it just uh, remains for me to thank B again for a very excellent talk and a very thought provoking talk. Um, which will make us maybe go in different directions with our research. And, and thank you all for listening. So uh, goodbye and thank you. Bye, thank you.